thank you for that introduction and thank you for sticking around. Um, 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 great to have the opportunity to present today. Uh, I'll walk you guys through some of the updates in the past year and a half in the uh, pulmonary and critical care world. Um, as pulmonologist, we are simple bedside clinicians. We could uh, take a listen to your lungs and determine whether it's wet or dry crackles and tell you whether you have heart failure or interstitial lung disease. We could just look at you and tell you what your lung capacity is. Uh, um, so uh, we're just that simple and that good at what we, are, what we are doing. I have a few of these to make this presentation tolerable today, so you'll uh, come across some of these uh, jokes throughout the presentation. Let me start with a few studies related to sepsis. Sepsis, as you all know, is one of the major um, syndrome, major condition that we treat in the intensive care unit. Over the past couple of decades, there has been a number of advancements in the way uh, we take care of patients with sepsis, and we've recognized the importance of early diagnosis and treatment. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign uh, was formed. It was an alliance between European and North Northern American countries uh, to develop guidelines to help physicians uh, guide physicians manage patients with sepsis. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines recommends that the following be performed within three hours of diagnosis of sepsis, so obtaining blood cultures, lactate, administering antibiotics, and administering 30 mils per kilogram of crystalloids are recommendation. In this study that I'm about to show, they, dis they wanted to explore if there is a benefit within that three-hour time period. Is it beneficial to perform these uh, uh, recommendations within one hour compared to two and a half hours. So that's what this study decided to explore. It's a retrospective study between 2011 and 2015. Close to 5,000 patients admitted to University of Minnesota with sepsis, severe sepsis or septic shock. The hospital mortality was around 28%. That's comparable to what's been shown uh, in terms of mortality for this uh, patients with severe sepsis and septic shock in other studies. So if you, um, uh, so they looked at all the different recommendations. So they were look, looked at antibiotics here. So the x-axis is time. And on y-axis on panel A is the average treatment effect. And then on panel B was in hospital mortality. So if you look at panel A, there was a, um, increase in mortality with any delay in treatment, even when it was within the three-hour mark. And it became statistically significant beyond 125 minutes. And on panel B, the dotted line are the patients that did not receive the treatment within that particular time. And in those who did not receive the treatment, as you could see, any delay in not receiving that treatment within the time was associated with increased mortality. Next, they looked at um, administration of fluids. At 100 minutes, beyond 100 minutes, there was a statistically significant increase in mortality with any delay in administration of this intervention. So what the study showed was any delay, even when it was performed within three hours, uh, any delay was associated with increased mortality. So with sepsis should be treated similar to acute MI, stroke. These patients need to be treated early uh, and with aggressive interventions early on, and there should be no delay in treatment. <laughs> Next, we'll look at steroids um, in septic shock. Steroids have been studied as a treatment option in sepsis, sepsis for a number of years. Uh, sepsis is characterized by dysregulated response, which is triggered by infection. And the overwhelming response, inflammation produced by the, by our, by the body to try to fight the infection leads to harm to their own body. And sepsis impairs hypothalamic pituitary adrenal excess, so it could affect the cortisol production in patients with sepsis. 
And steroids, as we all know, modulates the host response and uh, speculated by modulating this inflammatory response, it should be able to help these patients with sepsis. But like I mentioned in prior studies, the findings have been contradicting. So there's a difference in the um, way the clinicians practice. Some administer steroids and others don't. So. In this study, there were 34 centers in France um, that were involved. Close to 1,241 patients were recruited between the years of 2008 and 2015. Initially, it was, uh, the study had four arms. They had a hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone group compared to activated protein C, or Zygris, compared to all three, and the fourth group was placebo. Zygris, or activated protein C, was one of the medications that was approved for sepsis in the early 2000s. But post-marketing studies showed, showed increased mortality and worse outcomes, and it was withdrawn from the market in 2011. So once Cygris was discontinued, they continued the study with just steroids and, and uh, compared to placebo. So in the treatment arm, patients received hydrocortisone, 50 milligram, as an IV bolus every six hours. In addition to fludrocortisone, 50 micro, microgram once a daily, and the intervention was administered up to seven days, and they compared it to placebo group, which received placebo, placebo forms of uh, treatment um, of hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. So they included patients who are requiring higher amount of pressors, so more than 0.25 micrograms per kilogram, so a 100 kilogram person, which has to be on about 25 micrograms of pressors to be able to enroll in the study. And they had to be on pressors for about six hours before they were uh, enrolled in the study. They excluded anyone who had, had septic shock for longer than 24 hours who were at high risk for bleeding or pregnancy. And the outcome they were measuring was 90-day mortality. As you could see, there was right from the um, early on, from within the first day itself, there is uh, uh, improvement in survival seen with hydrocortisone, fludrocortisone compared to placebo. <clears throat> the primary outcome that they were looking at, um, which was 90-day mortality, was 43% in the hydrocortisone, fludrocortisone group compared to 49% in placebo. So there was an absolute risk reduction, about 7%. So every, patient, every 15 patients treated, about one patient would have a survival advantage by receiving hydrocortisone compared to fludrocortisone. If you look at all the secondary outcomes, that at 28 days, at ICU discharge, hospital discharge, all of those were uh, better with hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone compared to the placebo. There was also some advantage in terms of number of vasopressor-free days, ventilator-free days, and organ failure-free days in those who received hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. As expected, more, as expected, the incidence of hyperglycemia was higher in the steroid group. But there was no dif difference in other ad adverse events such as infections and things like that. Interestingly, in the same edition of New England Journal of Medicine, there was another study published which looked at steroids and sepsis. But these centers um, were mostly from um, Australia and Europe. And in this study, they had 3,658 patients between 2013 and 2017. They administered the same amount of hydrocortisone, but they delivered it as a continuous infusion and compared it to placebo, and the treatment was administered up to seven days. Inclusion criteria was age over 18 years, mechanical ventilation, and septic shock with any amount of pressors. They did not require that they had, had to be on a certain dose. They, any amount of pressors for over four hours were included in the study. They excluded anyone similar to other study which shocked for longer than 24 hours. So if they have received a tomidate, which is a, uh, known to suppress the adrenal glands, and it's typically administered when uh, it's a medication that's uh, uh, administered when we intubate patients. Uh, 
Uh, so if they had received that, they were excluded from the study as well. And if they had a limitation of treatment in place, they were excluded as well. So this study, interestingly, did not show a difference, survival advantage with steroids. And when they looked at secondary outcomes, mortality was not different between the placebo and hydrocortisone group. There was a slight, uh, there was a decrease in time to resolution of shock by one day in those who received hydrocortisone, and there was a decrease in time to discharge from ICU by two days, but otherwise the, did not show a significant difference between the groups. And in predefined subgroup analysis, there was no significant differences, uh, significant difference between the two groups. But if you look at those, those with severe shock requiring more than 15 microgram of pressors, there was a slight trend towards better survival with hydrocortisone. But overall, it was a neutral study. So what are the reasons, what are the potential um, um, differences and um, between the studies and what are the um, what's the reason for discrepancy uh, it's not clear but there were some differences between the studies as I pointed out um, the first study they gave fludrocortisone is it the fludrocortisone that contributed to some of the um, survival advantage seen in the first study. It's not clear, but there are a number of other studies that have shown there is no advantage to adding fludrocortisone when they're already on higher doses of hydrocortisone. The population that was studied in the first study was much sicker. They had less, uh, more medical patients, usually patients with sepsis, uh, secondary to medical reasons, and if there wasn't a source that could be surgically removed, tends to have a higher mortality. So in the first study, more pay, there were more sicker patients and more medical, medical patients uh, than in the second study. And the way the steroids were administered was different. It was administered uh, as an IV bolus every six hours compared to continuous infusion in the second study. Um, was that a cause for the difference? It's not clear. But interestingly, any steroid study that seems to um, come out of France seems to be always a positive study, but everywhere else seems to be a, uh, when it studies everywhere else, it seems to be a negative study. So is it something specific to the French? Uh, or maybe they're not telling us, maybe they, for, for their resuscitation, maybe they use red wine instead of uh, what we use here, which is simple crystallites. I'm not endorsing use of wine here. I know when the alcohol was brought up earlier, that led to a lot of question, so I'm not, I'm just, it's just a joke. I'm not endorsing anything. <laughs> um, let's move on to talk about a um, condition called acute respiratory distress syndrome. That's a, another major condition, illness that we take care of in our intensive care unit. Um, so in this study, they looked at extracorporeal life support or extracorporeal mem membranous oxygen oxygenation for patients with severe ARDS. This technology was uh, pioneered by Dr. Robert Bartlett. Um, so the way it works is the blood is, venous blood is drawn out of the body from a femoral vein or internal jugular vein, and it's pumped into this oxygenator. So on one side of the membrane is the blood, and on the other side, the oxygen mixed with air is um, blended into the oxygenation, oxygenator. Um, and the oxygen is able to diffuse through the membrane to enrich the blood, and the carbon dioxide is able to diffuse out of the blood. And by increasing the flow, we call it the sweep, increasing the sweep, we are able to pull more oxygen out of the blood. And by adjusting the oxygen fraction, we are able to increase the oxygenation and enrich the blood, venous blood. And then it's put back into the vein or an artery, depending on if it's veno-venous ECMO or veno-arterial. So usually if it's just lung injury and if the heart is working fine, 
typically um, we would do venovenous ECMO, but if they are also in cardiogenic shock, then it's veno-arterial. In that case, the blood's pumped into the arterial side. So in this study, they included patients with severe ARDS. Severe ARDS was defined as oxygen, PaO2, your oxygen pressure in the arterial blood gas, divided by fraction of oxygen. And if that number was less than 80, that's typically someone with severe ARDS. And if that lasted for about six, six hours, then they enrolled patients into the two arms, either ECMO or, or um, conventional ventilation. If they had severe acidosis and if they were already on maximum lung protective ventilation and was not able to improve the uh, acidosis, then they were enrolled um, in this intervention as well. They excluded patients who had been on ventilation for longer than seven days, those who had chronic respiratory insufficiency, cardiac failure requiring venoarterial ECMO, or if they had a history of HIT because these patients need to be anticoagulated to prevent the blood from clotting, or if they were comatose after a cardiac arrest, uh, they were excluded as well. So ECMO group received venovenous cannulation and they were placed on heparin infusion. They did allow crossover if the patients in the control group um, had sustained oxygen saturations level eight, less than 80% for longer than six hours. So you could, as you could see, you know, um, that's, they have a pretty stringent criteria for crossing over to the uh, ECMO arm. Um, and what they looked at, the main outcome was 60-day mortality. They did terminate the study early because when they did this interim analysis at about 75% enrollment, they figured continuing up to 100% uh, would not be beneficial and they wouldn't reach the significance that they were looking for. Uh, but there were about 28% of the patients in the control group that had crossed over to ECMO because of uh, uh, difficulty maintaining the oxygenation, but also half of those patients were placed on ECMO during a cardiac arrest. As you could see, there was the primary outcome, which was mortality at 60 days, it was 35% in the ECMO group versus 46% in the control group, but did not reach statistical significance. But if they included all those patients that crossed over and when they were considered as they were considered as treatment failure, and they were more likely to die without having crossed over to ECMO, um, and when they compared the two groups which had treatment failure, then there was statistically significant benefit in uh, receiving ECMO. And obviously those who received ECMO treatment required less of other salvage therapies such as prone positioning, recruitment maneuvers, and inhaled nitric oxide. Again, um, it's a trend towards improved survival with ECMO, but did not reach statistical significance. The adverse events were similar, except for a requirement for blood transfusion, which was higher in patients who required, uh, who were placed on ECMO. So there's no statistically significant benefit of ECMO compared to conventional ventilation. Um, the, High crossover rate makes it difficult to draw definitive conclusions, but it's uh, you know in those patients who we are not able to oxygenate, that's uh, that's the only intervention we have available, and these uh, the technology is continuing to improve, and the survival and outcomes that we are seeing with uh, ECMO is continuing to uh, be promising. So you know, uh, hopefully there'll be future studies which would show benefit. But this is a very sick population, and trying to show mortality differences uh, quite difficult with this uh, uh, severe ARDS population. Um, in case you guys are still wondering why we call it the ICU, this is. Uh, um, I'm going to show you some um, couple of. Um, images from, uh, uh, some interesting images from uh, New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a case of um, Munier-Kuhn syndrome. So this was described in 1932 by Dr. Munier-Kuhn. Uh, 
So what you're seeing is a large trachea. Usually the trachea is about 1.5 to 2 centimeters. So here it's about 3.5 centimeters. And this condition, it's a, a congenital condition and leads to dilation of trachea and bronchi, which puts them at risk for having infections. And uh, um, a lot of them develops bronchiectasis. But interestingly, this patient had uh, some mild bronchiectasis, which could be seen on the x-ray. I'm not sure if you guys are able to see that, but um, uh, I, there's no, this patient fortunately didn't have significant bronchiectasis. We'll look at some pulmonary studies. This is a study that um, looked at administration of TELC in addition to a plurex catheter in patients with malignant effusion. Um, about 154 patients were enrolled between 2012 and 2016. They were patients were excluded if they had extensively trapped lung, or if they have had failed attempts at pleurodesis in the past eight weeks, or if they had loculated fluid collection. So all patients had a indwelling pleural catheter placed, and they returned in 10 days to have maximum drainage, and they had a chest X-ray that was done right after the, having the fluid drain. If they had less than 75% pleural apposition or more than one-third opacification on X-ray, they were deemed ineligible to receive TELC, because it's unlikely the pleura will come together if uh, uh, that would suggest the lung is trapped significantly. So the group that was um, randomized to uh, receiving TELC had TELC administered, and the control group had saline. They used opaque syringes to try to blind these patients. Um, subsequent to having, this, uh, having the intervention, they had uh, drainage at least twice a week, but the frequency was determined by their local pulmonologist. The primary outcome they were looking at was successful pleurodesis at 35 days. So successful pleurodesis was defined by less than 50 milliliters of fluid drained in three consecutive occasions. And chest X-ray post-drainage showing less than 25% of opacification of the hemithorax. So at 35 days of five weeks, uh, more patients that received TELC uh, through the Plurex catheter had achieved pleurodesis compared to the placebo group. Um, so it was close to about 45% compared to about 20%. So administration of TELC has clearly shown that it's efficacious uh, in patients who have Plurex catheter placed uh, when they don't have significantly trapped lung. another image from um, New England Journal of Medicine. So this nicely demonstrates the uh, long-term complications of having, uh, having an IVC filter that's left in. So this is a patient that had an IVC filter placed five years ago for a DVT, uh, came in with right-sided flank pain. And as you could see, the uh, IVC had fractured and strut had embolized to the right ventricle, and another piece had uh, buried into the uh, paravertebral muscle, uh, and then another piece next to the ureter. So they were able to successfully remove this uh, intravascularly, but they decided to leave those alone because they were buried into the um, uh, surface and would be risky to try to remove those. So, it's very important to try to retrieve those IVC filters as soon as possible. Next, we'll look at a study which um, investigated the role of non-invasive ventilation for patients with COPD. So these are uh, patients with COPD who have recurrent excess, they tend to have recurrent exacerbations and hospitalizations, and persistent hypercapnia is associated with increased mortality. There's 116 patients that were enrolled between 2010 and 2015, and they were randomized to non-invasive ventilation in addition to home oxygen versus home oxygen alone. So again, these are COPD patients with baseline PaCO2 more than 53, 
and hypoxemia, PaO2 less than 55. Um, they were enrolled two to four weeks after an acute exacerbation for which they had to be treated with non-invasive ventilation. They excluded anyone uh, with BMI more than 35 or, any, or anyone who had other causes for having chronic hypercapnic failure such as OSA, neuromuscular, or chest wall disease. The primary outcome they were measuring was time to readmission or death within 12 months. So as you could see, those who received non-invasive ventilation, there was a decrease in time to, um, there was a uh, decrease in time to readmission or death. There was median was 4.3 months compared to 1.4 months in those who received oxygen alone. And the number of patients that uh, got readmitted or died was lower in the non-invasive ventilation group compared to uh, those who received oxygen alone. Um, most of the, uh, the difference seen here is due to reduction in readmissions because the mortality was similar. And when they looked at health-related quality of life assessments, they did slightly better with non-invasive uh, ventilation compared to the patients that were receiving oxygen alone. Um, Again, in admission-free survival, so those who survived without readmission was higher in the non-invasive ventilation group compared to oxygen alone. So non-invasive ventilation, <coughs> based on this study, demonstrates improved time to readmission in patients with severe COPD. Uh, but these patients uh, have severe disease, very poor lung capacity, so it's, again, um, requires often larger numbers to be able to show a mortality difference or you know, even to, um, because of their severity of disease, the improvement seen in health-related quality of life assets assessment was only modest. Next, we'll look at use of procalcitonin, which is a biomarker that's used in patients with um, respiratory tract infection. It's in community-acquired pneumonia, procalcitonin has been shown to reduce the number of days of uh, antibiotic administration. So it's a peptide. It becomes elevated during a bacterial infection. The levels of elevation has shown to correlate with severity, and decreasing levels have shown to improve resolution. So you know, often based on some prior studies with community-acquired pneumonia, when we see the procalcitonin levels have reached um, normal levels, less than 0.25 is typically considered uh, less than normal. Ten, uh, the physicians tend to have a lower threshold for discontinuing antibiotics. But in this study, in this randomized controlled trial between 2014 and 2017 at 14 U.S. sites, close to 1,600 patients, um, they decided to study its usefulness in patients admitted to the ED with in whom the physician was suspecting a lower respiratory tract infection, but they were unsure if they needed antibiotics or not. So they provided procalcitonin gu guideline education to all physicians, and those who were hospitalized, they had levels, subsequent levels checked at day three, five, and seven. Um, and the primary outcome they were looking at is total antibiotic days within 30 days. So this is the algorithm we typically follow. So anyone with levels less than 0.25 are discouraged to continue antibiotics. And if they have levels 0.25, it's recommended that the antibiotics are continued. So as you could see, the majority of them had levels less than 0.25. So almost 90% of patients had less, levels less than 0.25 at baseline. Um, and majority of them, the final diagnosis was asthma or COPD. Uh, about one-fourth of them had bronchitis, and only about 20% had pneumonia. So a lot of them had other causes for respiratory symptoms that they came in with, but was suspected by physicians, emergency department physicians at the time, to have uh, infection, but they weren't, um, um, there was suspicion, but not sufficient enough that they definitely needed antibiotics. So they suspected and they were uh, unsure whether the antibiotics was required or not. Those were the patients that were studied in this, uh, uh, in this study. 
they saw that there was no difference in utilizing procalcitonin for, um, to help with management of these patients. And um, as you could see, there was no difference in the intention to treat population. When they looked at those who were complied by the protocol and had all the follow-up assessments, there was no difference in the antibiotic days. And also in those uh, who strictly followed the guideline recommendations, there was no difference in the uh, antibiotic days. When they looked at just the community-acquired pneumonia population, um, there was also no difference in the group that utilized procalcitonin compared to the control. So in this study, uh, procalcitonin-guided antibiotic prescrip prescription did not result in less antibiotic exposure. But there was um, one of the major flaws is majority of the physicians didn't necessarily comply with, uh, they were sort of um, designing it as sort of a real life study rather so they didn't want to strictly uh, force physicians to follow the protocol. So the adherence to protocol was only about 65%. So a lot of times, majority of the time, the um, failure to adhere was by administering antibiotics when it was not recommended. And in about a few of, few of the times, uh, antibiotics were recommended by the level of procalcitonin, but the physicians decided uh, not to administer it, so not to uh, follow the guideline. Let's look at um, studies related to uh, management of patients with severe asthma. So about 10% of the patients have uncontrolled severe asthma, as you all might have taken care of in your uh, practices. 60% uh, of the costs associated with asthma is spent in man taking care of patients with severe asthma due to frequent hospitalizations, frequent exacerbations requiring steroid bursts. Uh, there has been significant progress in the past five years identifying different phenotypes and sort of personalizing treatment for patients with asthma. So we've identified, we've, uh, we've um, started to categorize patients as having inflammatory phenotype or non-type 2 inflammatory phenotype. So the type 2 inflammation is triggered by antigens allergies, and the non-type 2 inflammation is irritants, pollutants, and uh, microbes, viruses. Um, the inflammatory phenotype driven by allergies, antigens, are um, propagated by mast cells, eosinophils, IgE, and non-allergic phenotypes are usually uh, driven by neutrophils. So the important cytokines in the inflammatory phenotype are IL-4, 5, and 13 and IgE. <clears throat> Omalizumab was the, uh, one of the uh, targeted asthma drugs that was introduced in the early 2000s that binds to IgE and has shown to, uh, in a certain group of patients with high IgE, uh, decrease asthma symptoms and exacerbations. In the past few years, we've had a number of medications that are able to target IL-5. Uh, those are mepolizumab, reslizumab, and venralizumab. In the past year, there were a couple of studies that uh, looked at dupulimab, which, is a, which targets IL-4 and IL-13. So it's a dupulimab. It's an antibody that binds to the IL-4 receptor. So it's able to inhibit the IL-4 and IL-13 signaling and thereby uh, prevent activation of eosinophils and mast cells. So in this Liberty Asthma Quest study, around 1,900 patients with uncontrolled severe asthma was enrolled between 2015 and 2016. Um, so they had dupulimab 200 milligram and another second group with dupulimab 300 milligram compared to matched placebos to both of those drugs. And the medication was administered every two weeks for up to 52 weeks. 
The primary endpoints they were looking at were exacerbations and change in FEV1 at 12 weeks. An exacerbation was defined as worsening symptoms requiring treatment with steroids for three days or hospitalization. So here they divided them into subgroups by the number of um, eosinophils into more than 300, 150 to 300, and less than 150, and also by the fraction of exhaled nitric oxides, or high nitric oxide usually suggests eosinophil-driven uh, mechanisms as a cause of asthma. Uh, so with dupulimab, patients who had high eosinophil counts and high exhaled nitric oxide had decreased exacerbations. So this was 200 milligram, and similar observation, similar findings were uh, noted with dupulimab, 300 milligram as well. So with high eosinophil counts, so anyone with more than 150 eosinophils um, had less exacerbations with dupulimab compared to placebo. When they looked at change in FEV1. Uh, both dupulimab 200 and 300 milligrams had more significant improvement in FEV1 by about 200 milliliters compared to the placebo group. So the, at background, everyone was on uh, triple inhalers. All the patients were on uh, uh, three inhalers, inhaled corticosteroid, long-acting beta agonist, and long-acting muscarinic agent. So the study showed that dupulimab decreased exacerbations and increased lung function. And it also showed that IL-4 and IL-13 pathways are significant driver of inflammation in asthma. And having higher baseline eosinophil count or exhaled nitric oxide was predictive of greater response to dupulimab. There was a transient increase noted in eosinophils in those who received dupulimab. That's not unexpected because what the IL-4 and IL-13 pathway does is it activates eosinophil. It does not suppress eosinophil production by the, by the bone marrow. IL-5 is the cytokine that uh, determines eosinophil um, uh, production from the bone marrow. So as expected, uh, the uh, finding increased eosinophils temporarily was not, a, uh, uh, was not unexpected. So this looks like a USB drive, but it's not. It's an increasingly popular e-cigarette called Juul. So something to, you know, teachers and parents should be cautious about because they're coming in so so many different uh, USBs and you know things that um, students, children commonly use. Um, and they come in, as you could see, they come in so many different forms. E-cigarettes, they produce an aerosol by heating a liquid that contains nicotine flavorings and other chemicals. In this randomized trial, they compared e-cigarette to nicotine replacement therapy uh, in, uh, to, in patients uh, to facilitate uh, quitting smoking. So patients were enrolled in three sites in UK between 2015 and 2018. So these are smokers attending UK NHS Stop Smoking Service. So it's a free service available across UK. So these are all patients that are seeking help and willing to quit. So they were randomized on the quit date to either nicotine replacement therapy or e-cigarettes. And they were provided behavioral support every week for about four weeks. And then they were contacted by telephone at 26 and 52 weeks to follow up to see how they were doing. Uh, primary endpoint was sustained abstinence for one year. And abstinence was defined as, uh, was determined based on self-reporting and confirmed with carbon monoxide levels uh, being less than eight parts per million. So the primary outcome, which was abstinence at 52 weeks, um, the findings are pretty dismal. Only about 18% in the e-cigarette group 
was able to successfully quit compared to 9.9% in the nicotine replacement therapy. But it was better. The numbers were low in both groups, but it was definitely significantly better in the e-cigarette group compared to nicotine replacement. We look at secondary outcomes, abstinence between 26 and 52 weeks, as well as abstinence at four weeks were all better with e-cigarettes compared to nicotine replacement therapy. Um, whether it is gums, uh, could be patches, any of those. Um, and interestingly, at four weeks, already about 50 to 70 percent of the patients have not been able to abstain from smoking. Um, abstinence at 26 were also 35 percent compared to 25 percent, so it was significantly better with e-cigarettes. In terms of side effects, there was more nausea in the nicotine replacement therapy group, and there was more throat or mouth irritation with the e-cigarette group. So the e-cigarettes were more effective in uh, smoking cessation compared to nicotine replacement therapy. But in those who had stopped, the 18% in nicotine replacement therapy, 18% in the e-cigarette group and 9% in the nicotine replacement therapy. Out of those who had stopped, 80% were still using the e-cigarettes for cravings, compared to only 9% of the patients that had stopped were still using nicotine replacement therapy as a substitute for cravings. So they may have given up the smoking, but they might be addicted to e-cigarettes now. Um, the Measurement of abstinence was not the, uh, the outcome they were measuring is not robust because the carbon monoxide, they depended mostly on self-reporting. The carbon monoxide monitoring only validates uh, smoking or cigarette use over the past 24 hours. It doesn't necessarily uh, determine the, um, their use throughout the year. So they are ma mainly depending on self-reporting. And it's not blinded, so obviously that could lead to a lot of bias. Um, and e-cigarette, they're not regulated, so the aerosol can contain cancer-causing chemicals, heavy metals, and diacetyl, which is a chemical that's shown to lead to a certain type of lung condition called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So based on this study, I wouldn't recommend uh, e-cigarettes to our patients, even though it was published on New England Journal of Medicine. It's a uh, number of issues with this study. Um, so maybe it's not the patch, it's where you put the patch is probably what matters. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. And we do have some time for questions. Any questions? A lot of questions. This is a question rich area right here. Yeah, it's contagious over here. Um, you, you presented a study where really it was a negative study for procalcitonin, mm -hmm. but there, there was a Cochrane review, it was in 2017. And, and they showed, a, it says here that they had a, there was actually a decrease in mortality, number needed to treat of 71, and also 2.4 fewer overall days of exposure to antibiotics and, uh, and, and fewer overall antibiotic-related adverse effects. I think they said it was like 26 studies or something like that. That, mm -hmm. that to me seemed to be promising for procalcitonin, especially in a day and age where we really overuse antibiotics. Unfortunately, procalcitonin is, is too expensive at this time, but you know, maybe in the next 10 years, the price drops, it really could help us with our antibiotic stewardship. Yeah, no, I pointed out some of the issues with the study. A lot of, uh, they didn't um, uh, demand that the physician strictly follow the, guide, follow the guidelines. So, you know, there were more than 40% of time the physicians, even though they were assigned to the group to use the procalcitonin, uh, levels and follow the guidelines they were not following. So I think that was, uh, that could have partly contributed, but also the population they were studying, mo most of them didn't, based on the procalcitonin levels, more than 90% had a normal level. So they are, may not be studying it in the right population. And I agree, there are a number of studies previously has shown in bacterial 
pneumonia, especially community acquired pneumonia, use of procalcitonin level does help um, decrease the duration. It doesn't necessarily tell you whether you should initiate antibiotics or not because sometimes you don't see the spike till the next day, 24 hours later, but it does help you narrow down the duration of, narrow down the antibiotics and uh, duration. And uh, one of my uh, uh, mentors saw it from uh, Rush University. He does a lot of study with procalcitonin and he did publish a, a large uh, big data study showing that just having obtained a procalcitonin level at admission in those who had a procalcitonin level measured uh, within the first day had a better outcome, decreased uh, mortality. So I think it's studying it in the right population and obviously it's not, uh, that sh should not be the only factor that goes into your decision. Obviously we're looking at other clinical signs, symptoms. It does not go up on in viral infections, so it, hel it does help differentiate viral from bacterial. But I think the main flaw with the study was, you know, they, they did not dictate that the guideline be strictly followed. Your study with e-cigarettes versus patch for quit rate at six months and a year. Any comparison to cold turkey and counseling? Um, co comparing cold turkey versus counseling or, or with going cold no, turkey? Cold turkey with counseling versus e-cigarettes or patches. Um, that's not what was studied in this, but I think usually, you know, they, uh, we recommend that they, uh, they are determined to quit before we even start them on nicotine replacement. It's not you'd start the nicotine replacement therapy and also sort of continue to smoke and cut down by one to two cigarettes, you know, usually trying to set a quit date and deciding to uh, quit on that day's uh, previous scene has shown it's effective. When they say, oh, we're not ready to quit, you know, but we are ready to try the patches, it doesn't work. So prior studies have shown that, you know, you have to set a quit date and, uh, and the nicotine replacement in any form is only to try, to try to help the cravings, but if you're not ready to quit, it doesn't. doesn't Another work. question across the hall. When I was rotating through pulmonary medicine 50 years ago, the uh, specialists were using steam inhalations, clapping and vibration, postural drainage. Uh, do you still use these pulmonary hygiene measures to yeah. help clear secretions and yeah. resolve the chronic bronchitis? Yeah, we still use a lot of those. We have some fancy, uh, fancier tools now, but we still use the percussion and chest PT, and those are still effective, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question on this side. You know, um, how about the Shantix? Do they have any study? And you know, um, is it not included in this study of s smoking cessation? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't studied in this one, but that should be, you know, compared. It it's be. not. Yeah, should be done, and, and so we can have a comparison. You know, which one's more effective yeah. instead of just a single, just you know, the e-cigarettes yeah. yeah. or patches. Yeah, but Shantix know? is more effective than been shown to be more effective than uh, uh, nicotine patches gum. That goes but without saying. That's yeah. in my, my own population. Yeah. I go for Shantix before I yeah. tell them to take e-cigarette. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'll tell you, I was, I was surprised that it made it to, uh, into New England Journal of Medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And it was... Uh, I never was an ID person. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jaganathan. Thank you.